The Battle of the Eastern Solomons took place on August 24th and 25th, 1942, and was the third carrier battle of the Pacific War. The battle came to fruition as the Japanese attempted to carry out Operation Ka, a counteroffensive in response to the Allied landings on Guadalcanal that had taken place earlier in the month. Ka was aimed at reinforcing Guadalcanal, while giving the Imperial Navy a chance to destroy the naval forces directly supporting the Allied ground forces. Although technically somewhat of a draw, as neither side was able to secure a clear victory, the Allies gained tactical and strategic advantages from the engagement. The Japanese lost a significant number of aircraft and, more importantly, the experienced air crews that flew them, while the reinforcements earmarked for Guadalcanal were also delayed. However, this video is not intended to be an in-depth look at the overall battle, but instead a chance to review some truly incredible and harrowing footage of an aircraft carrier under attack. This film was shot aboard USS Enterprise during the aerial attack of the first strike wave on the afternoon of the 24th. At 2.25 on the afternoon of August 24th, a Japanese scout plane discovered the prized U.S. flattops northeast of San Cristobal Island. The first strike wave, consisting of 27 dive bombers and 15 Zeros, was in the air by 2.50, while a second wave, consisting of 27 dive bombers and 9 Zeros, was launched at 4 o'clock. As the second wave was being launched, Enterprise's radar detected the first strike. Enterprise and Saratoga launched every available fighter aircraft they had, and by 4.30, 53 F-4F Wildcats were heading out to meet the threat. But the American fighter planes ended up being too low to intercept the attackers before they got over the carriers. As they neared their targets, the attack wave split into two groups. Eighteen of them went after Enterprise, while the other nine flew on towards Saratoga who was operating several miles distant from Enterprise. These nine would end up aborting their run at Sarah as the distance was too great. Instead, they refocused their attention to Enterprise, which meant that nearly the entire first strike was bearing down on the Big E's task force at about a quarter to five that afternoon. This is where our footage begins. As you can see, Enterprise is in the middle of a pretty dramatic turn to starboard in an effort to thwart the efforts of the Japanese pilots when the first bomb strikes her near the corner of her aft elevator. Moments later, the second bomb strikes her about 15 feet from the first hit. This strike took out both of her starboard aft 5-inch mounts and killed most of their crews. A pretty intense fire erupts, as you can see. Now, you can see the camera shake and mist spraying Enterprise's flight deck after several near misses, right before the third strike is recorded near her number two elevator. This bomb strike has been reproduced for many years as a still photo and is quite famous, but the photo actually comes from a frame of this film. And, contrary to popular belief, the combat photographer who recorded this harrowing footage survived and was not killed in action, as has been erroneously reported throughout the years. His name was Marion Riley, and he was stationed on the aft end of Enterprise's island, where he caught all of this incredible footage. As the dust begins to settle, you can see a pretty good size hole in the carrier's flight deck near her number two elevator. In all, Enterprise had been struck by three bombs and had four near misses. The first bomb strike detonated between the second and third decks, causing extensive damage, but nothing structural minor flooding, and disabled her number three elevator. The second bomb struck close to the starboard edge, near the same elevator, and bent her flight deck upward while causing a severe fire as powder for the five-inch guns ignited. The third bomb detonated on impact with the flight deck. It put her number two elevator out of commission and started a small fire. In all, 74 members of Enterprise's crew were killed and 95 more were wounded. Now you can tell that Seaman Riley is still alive and well as he pans the camera over to look at a Japanese plane Enterprise's crew has just downed. As he swings the camera back, you start to see crew members beginning their damage control efforts as the attack has subsided. Five minutes, and it was over just like that. It is astonishing just how quickly these events unfolded, 
and the reaction time that the Big E's crew had to deal with the threats to their ship. Enterprise's damage control was superb. Despite her damage and casualties, the flight deck was temporarily repaired, and within one hour of the attack, she had resumed flight operations. This was due in part obviously to the fine work of her damage control parties, but the location of the strikes also aided her quick rebound as they all occurred on the outer third of the starboard side of her flight deck, and its structural integrity was maintained. Then, not long after she began recovering aircraft, Enterprise lost her steering as her rudder jammed over to starboard due to an electric rudder motor shorting out. As the second Japanese strike was inbound, Enterprise was steaming in a circle, unable to take any evasive action. Chief Machinist William A. Smith donned a self-contained breathing apparatus and entered the compartment. Smith was twice overcome and had to be pulled out by other sailors using a safety line. On his third attempt, Smith succeeded in starting the alternate motor, and the carrier regained steering control. While Enterprise was caught in this predicament, and the second Japanese strike was about ten minutes out, in what was probably the luckiest U.S. break of the battle, maybe even of the entire Guadalcanal campaign, the Japanese strike leader miscopied a position report on the U.S. carriers and changed course, and the second Japanese strike never found the U.S. carriers. The following day, Enterprise proceeded to Pearl Harbor for repairs. Enterprise reached Pearl Harbor on September 10th and remained there until mid-October undergoing repairs. Once these were completed, she once more departed for the South Pacific. She reached the combat zone just in time to participate in the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands on October 26th. Here, her cameras were once again rolling as she took evasive maneuvers to dodge Japanese munitions. In the first shots, you can see flight deck personnel rushing to re-spot her planes forward so an F-4F can land. The first strike of the day ended up concentrating on the carrier Hornet, as Enterprise was concealed by a rain squall when it arrived over the U.S. task force. But as luck would have it, she emerged from the squall just in time to be spotted by the departing strike aircraft. The second strike, believing Hornet was sunk and now knowing where the Big E was, zeroed in on her. In what was a running theme of early war U.S. carrier tactics, just like at the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, the U.S. Combat Air Patrol couldn't reach the inbound strike in time, and the majority of them kicked over on Enterprise without much effort, at least until they met the withering fire of the carrier's task force which managed to down 10 of the 19 attacking planes. The first group's deadly payloads all missed, but that wasn't true for the next group, as Enterprise was struck by two bombs and had a near miss as well. Forty-four men were killed, and another seventy-five were wounded. But Enterprise, the U.S. Navy's poster child for rugged resiliency, managed to resume air activities and maintained combat air patrols throughout the day as a succession of Japanese strike waves hit, which eventually caused Hornet to be abandoned and scuttled. This footage, similar to the footage from the Eastern Solomons, shows Enterprise again maneuvering wildly as mist from the splashes of near misses rains down on her decks while her gunners blast away. Enterprise reached New Caledonia on October 30th for repairs, but the loss of Hornet meant that she was now the only operational U.S. carrier in the South Pacific, and, as such, she received temporary repairs at New Caledonia and returned to support Allied forces during the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal in mid-November. I hope you enjoyed this video and that it gives some visual insight into what the maneuvering of an aircraft carrier under attack during the Pacific War looked like. Thank you for watching and, as always, if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, comment and subscribe so that we can bring you more content like this.